This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Bernstein. I'm an assistant professor here in the HCI group in the computer science department. Uh, and I'm here to introduce Kate Starbird. Um, of the many people who have visited this seminar with Wikipedia pages, Kate may be the only one whose page starts with the fact that she was a WNBA star. Um, Kate went and did uh, her PhD in Colorado, working on crisis informatics, uh, being one of a small group of people who really have pushed this to the forefront of sort of the study of how people deal with large scale disasters, uh, and especially as it inter intersects with how technology mediates that and how social media comes into play. Uh, she's now just beginning her first quarter as a professor in the Human Centered Design and Engineering program at the University of Washington. Uh, so we're really lucky that we can get her here roughly two weeks after she started teaching. Um, and after this, I'll give it away to Kate. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. He didn't. He also mentioned that it is my reunion year, and uh, <laughs> I was looking for a good reason to come back in town. And this is there's no better year than or no better reason than to come talk to you guys. Um, so I'm going to give uh, a talk here that covers a lot of the research that I did for my PhD, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the future directions that I am working on. Um, the talk is called Crowd Work, Crisis, and Convergence: Unpacking Crowdsource in the Context of Mass Disruption Events. As Michael said, um, the area that I've been working on is, uh, broadly speaking, crisis informatics. Um, it's broadly defined as sort of examining the social and technical aspects of ICT use during crises. And I was very fortunate to be working at the University of Colorado with Laisha Palin, who was one of two people that actually coined this crisis informatics term and has been looking at this area for several years now and has a very um, a, a nice NSF project called Project EPIC. Uh, which stands for Empowering the Public with Information During Crisis. So a lot of the work I'll be talking about was done in, in collaboration with colleagues there at the University of Colorado. I like to talk about um, what I do as sort of this combination of social computing and, and mass disruption events. So I, my work is at the intersection of these two. Social computing being like s social media and other CMC. I look at the collaboration and interaction that these tools enable often on a massive scale. And I look at that in the context of mass disruption events. And mass disruption is a, a term we're using to, to cover um, events that cause major disruption to the normal social routines. So events like disasters, natural and man-made, as well as maybe mass, mass emergencies, uh, extreme weather events, and also political protests. And so one of the interesting things we've been seeing in recent years is these mass disruption events have become mass convergence events online, where a lot of people come to participate. What's interesting is in the crisis, in the crisis uh, context, this isn't actually any, anything new. Um, sociologists of, dis of disaster have long known that after a disaster event, people will converge physically onto the scene to try to offer help. Um, among other things, they actually come for a lot of different reasons. And they've been called um, spontaneous volunteers. So there's this, this ethic of spontaneous volunteerism that's, that's always sort of happened in the context of mass disruption events, or as, as long as we've been studying, um, and studying it in we being sociologists of disaster. So what I've been seeing is that people are now using social media to, con to converge. And I'm sure you all kind of have a good picture of what that means. but. Um, so just to give you a, a few numbers, after the 2010 Haiti earthquake, Twitter was actually pretty young back then, um, Project Epic collected over 3 million tweets we, uh, from over 800,000 different uh, Twitterers. This is in the first two weeks after the event. Um, a year later, after the Japan earthquake, there were like dozens of Facebook posts per second. Twitter use was even higher. Uh, and just in a small event uh, last year, probably very few people even noticed it was happening, but I was collecting on some US tornadoes and I was getting 800 tweets per minute. And so just even small events now are generating a ton and ton of information. And there's a lot of opportunities for this digital convergence. Um, things we could, can do now that we couldn't do before. So with citizen reporting, we have this um, capability for people on the ground during an event to use their mobile phones or, or maybe they're still online to, to communicate and share information about what they're seeing and what's happening with the, the larger crowd. With, with um, maybe their peers, maybe emergency responders in a new way. So we, people are suddenly enabled to be sensors and, and reporters of what's going on. There's also possibilities for, uh, uh, for formal responders to use 
um, use these tools to communicate to people that are affected by disaster. So they can use them as a crisis communication channel. There's also a lot of uh, challenges with this digital convergence. So um, just to name a few, we've got this huge volume of information. And it's hard to just wade through it, even if all of it was good. And it turns out not very much of it is, is interesting. So most of the volume is noise. So if we're looking for information coming from the ground that could help us um, get a better situational awareness of what's going on, well, we really don't care about you know, all these people out in the crowd who are retweeting things or saying, you know, uh, we support the people, we, we want them to feel better. But you know, that doesn't really help us get the information from the crowd. So there's a lot of just noise that we have to um, wade through. There's also a problem of lost context, which is particularly tough for platforms like Twitter, where information actually loses um, the connection between who initially created it and what time it was created. And so if you can imagine a, um, a tweet that says you, need to, you might need to evacuate, we have a, a voluntary evacuation at 4 p.m. and someone tweets that out at 8 p.m., well, it actually could be um, very bad information. The, the evacuation could be mandatory by then. So you've got this, um, this problem with the information propagation that, that, that things can get lost. And then we also have, related to that, misinformation, disinformation, people putting bad inf information into the system, whether on purpose or not, and that information spreading. Another problem is the unstructured nata nature of social media data. I do a lot of uh, work on um, Twitter. Uh, but I, I think this is true of most platforms, is that the, the information isn't in a way, isn't in a structure that we can easily collect it, aggregate it, uh, categorize it, process it, and, and things like that. So, so there's all these sort of issues that are interesting to look at. And so um, I guess when I entered the space and I have sort of an, an engineer background, I'm like, well, how do we solve the problem? How do we get useful, how do we extract useful information from, from all of these social media platforms? And, um, and make them into useful resources that people can use to help them make informed decisions during disaster events. And to give away a lot from the beginning here, what, uh, what I ended up finding um, that those, technically the problem is very hard, but that the crowd is already working in many ways to help organize this information. And they're doing that in a, in a variety of different uh, capacities. One is it's digital volunteers, where people in the remote crowd actually are intentionally trying to help um, uh, structure information, filter information, pass information on to people who can use it. Um, we've got emergent response organizations where digital volunteers are starting to work together, and um, I'll talk about this a lot today, form organizations that, that uh, help to process information and move it around. Some of these groups are becoming ongoing virtual volunteer organizations. They're even becoming NGOs now, where they're, um, uh, they intend to keep responding to different crisis events and different ways to help process information during disasters. and. Um, Another way that people are working is, uh, well, if you, you switch perspective, you can actually see like all of the activity of the crowd in some ways helps to organize it, and then we can actually leverage some of that um, ambient activity, all of those retweets or the follows during an event um, on Twitter, or connections, new connections being made on Facebook maybe to help identify um, information, uh, in, interesting information during events. So I'm going to talk about this uh, as crowd work. Um, I'm actually going to, to resist a, a term uh, crowdsourcing. Initially, I thought my research was crowdsourcing. And the more and more I looked into it, the more I, more I kept seeing my, my research fall a little bit outside of the crowdsourcing term. Um, so I'm going to critique the term a little bit, show you where, where my work doesn't quite fit. Um, and another thing related to that, every time I say this to someone from the social sciences, they'll say, well, what do you mean by a crowd? And I think that's an interesting, an interesting question always to start out when you're thinking about a crowdsourcing platform or anything. Um, and so what I mean by a crowd is not necessarily a crowd of number. A lot of the um, activities I see are small groups of people, 20 people, two people. Um, there are also great, great big groups of people. We can use the actions of hundreds of thousands of people to, to get information. So what I mean by crowd is nece not necessarily size, although it's the potential of size. So it's the potential to find people that can help. Um, but also, for me, the crowd, and I don't think this is true of all crowdsourcing, for, for me, the crowd is often the audience uh, the, of an event. So the, the convergent audience of people that want to participate because they're interested in an event, they come together. And for me, that, that changes some of the motivations for why the crowd is there during disaster events. And, and it, has, it speaks to some of the interesting things that I see. So I'm going to cover um, a few studies that we've done on um, crowd work that I was involved with at EPIC. And uh, I will start again from 
from my silly little question where I, I was going to change the world. So how do I extract useful information from social media updates? And initially and, and often we've, we've concentrated on Twitter. And um, it's not just because I'm a huge Twitter fan. I became a Twitter fan afterwards. But initially, I wasn't on Twitter myself when I started their research. Um, but it has some affordances that make it um, valuable in the crisis context, um, useful for res researchers, and uh, which is a nice combination, and also useful for people trying to, to build tools. So um, Twitter has, uh, it's everything in Twitter, not everything, but almost everything is public. Which, and it's searchable, which means if you can tap into the APIs, you can, you can pull it. So unlike Facebook, where um, it, it, people have privacy connections and people can't see the information, and Twitter, when you get an account, you know that all your information is going to be public. And so for that reason, it's actually ha has seen some interesting adoption in, cri in the crisis context. A lot of the emergency response managers I know who are moving into social media think of Twitter as their major platform because it's something that they could actually talk, talk with their um, constituents or their, the people they work for, as well as get information from the crowd. So that's, I'm not going to give you, I'm going to assume that uh, everyone here knows some of the underlying things of Twitter. If you don't, most of this will make sense. You might be lost a little bit. Um, but what I initially try to do is, is say, how can we take tweets and process them categorize them, map them, figure out what's interesting about them during a disaster event, and help like make the information useful. And a lot of, uh, Epic's actually a big project. There were 20, 25 researchers on the project, and a lot of them were looking at natural language processing strategies. And, and I was in on the conversations, and I was listening, and I could tell it was really, really, really hard. And it was, it was hard in a sense that they still hadn't figured out how to do it. And it was hard in a sense that their best that they were going to do was about 80 to 85% in terms of um, accuracy of what they could do. And they weren't even close to being there yet. And so, um, so I thought, well, maybe there are different strategies for helping to, um, helping to process this information. And like the good young researcher I was of just, oh, there's a simple solution. And I thought, well, why don't we just shift the burden of interpretation from machines to people and have people put their information in tweets in a way that makes it machine readable? And if we were going to do that, how could we do that? So, I was actually at, uh, that, becomes, that idea becomes the, the beginning of the Tweak the Tweet project, which is sort of the, my launching point into this research. Um, but I was at a random hacks of kindness uh, hackathon in the crisis space. It was actually the first one. They've gone on to have many of these now. And I was working with uh, another researcher there. And I came up with this idea of using a hashtag-based syntax, so basically leveraging what people were already using, or what they already knew about the hashtag and um, using a hashtag-based syntax to have people mark up their tweets in a way that we could um, get information from it. And so to go over it really simply, um, we were asking them to put certain hashtags in certain places to tell, um, basically tell a computer what they were talking about so we could easily classify this tweet as a need. We could see what, they, what was needed. We've got a, a location information that we could send to a mapping, uh, a mapping tool and contact information and other things. They could mark it up with, with several different ways. So basically what we tried to do was teach people to make their tweets machine readable. And our idea um, for, for doing this was we would use prescriptive tweeting and we would send it out in the space and somehow people would get the message that they could put their information in this way and they would do it and they would be able to report what was going on from the ground. Very simplistic. I'll tell you what we learned about that later. Um, but we did end up uh, building, I, I built an infrastructure um, pretty lightweight to make that work where I would um, do some, uh, collect tweets, process them, get uh, some geolocation information. I would, put it, I would put the process information on like a spreadsheet so people could see what was going on. And then uh, we would eventually, we mapped them so people could see, uh, we would map them and color them by what they, how they were categorizing things. These crisis maps have been become popular. When I built the infrastructure, I was basically just trying to show proof of concept, because I was more interested in the data than the tools. Um, but for some reason, the public likes to see their information going into maps, but we're not yet sure if um, responders can use those maps. Um, so anyways, we built the infrastructure. We end up launching Tweak the Tweet for um, over 30 events between 2009 and 2011. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I have learned some interesting things. I'm not sure if the project keeps going, but I keep intending to stop it, but keep, people keep pulling me back into it to do it again. So I might have to set up the infrastructure to make it work without me. Um, I'll put that on my list of things to do. But it was our, our, uh, our, first, um, our first deployment of this where we really, um, well, we learned a lesson that we kept learning over and over again. 
but it turns out to be um, pretty fascinating. So I'm going to concentrate on that here. So the Haiti earthquake was a massive earthquake. It hit uh, Haiti on the 12th of January 2010. It caused catastrophic damage. It had, afterwards, there was a huge humani humanitarian need, and it took weeks for humanitarian response to really, not weeks, it's, they're still trying to, to get a picture of what's going on there. Um, Haiti is, is interesting. It has actually been noted by many as, a, as marking a turn in the realization by the humanitarian response that they had to consider social media data and that there was this thing called digital volunteerism. So the event itself was the first time where, where digital volunteers, crowd activity, and social media activity came to the surface enough that humanitarian response was like, oh, this is something we might, we might need to deal with. Hey, Kate, yes? Why do you think that was? What changed? There, there are things about, some of this behavior had already been going on. There were things about the event. Haiti was a huge event. It was very close to the US. So people were connected to it in interesting, in interesting ways. Um, there was a lot of media attention there. People could feel it viscerally, so they were interested in it. And I think that caused some of the extra um, attention. At the same time, Twitter was just becoming something that was uh, popular enough. There were enough users there that, that we could see some of that behavior. And also, the Ushahidi platform put down a, a, um, a crisis mapping instance, which I'll talk about way later in this talk. Um, where they were mapping SMS messages from the ground in Haiti and telling the responders they could look at it and the responders didn't know what to do with it yet. Um, so there's an interesting, if anyone's really interested in this, there's a report called the Disaster 2.0 Relief Report and that talks about the, con the problems the humanitarian responders had in dealing with the data. So we, um, we had not quite fleshed out Tweak the Tweet. We had actually come up with it in this community of other um, technicians in, in crises. And w with that community, it was called Crisis Commons, we decided to deploy Tweak the Tweet on, on January 14th. Actually, at the time, not thinking that people on the ground would be using it. We actually did, knew that, that people in, in Haiti weren't using Twitter. There are, there, there are many users there now, but there weren't many there. Um, but we thought maybe responders could use it to help communicate when they got there. We learned a lot of lessons about that. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how that deployment went. So we ended up, um, uh, we deployed it. We sent thousands of prescriptive tweet messages out there. And in the end, uh, we collected data of anyone who sent a tweet tweet. So anyone who ever sent a tweet tweet, whether it was a retweet or they sent it directly, um, we identified them and captured all their tweets during the event. And we went through and did an analysis. And we found that four people sent tweet tweets from the ground. They sent a total of 10 tweets um, with their needs of, I need water or something else. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, although um, this, won't, yeah, this won't surprise anyone, it's really hard to teach people to think and tweet like a computer, especially people that are affected um, at the time. But what was interesting was we found 74 people in the crowd who translated information into the syntax. And so they would take information they were finding elsewhere um, like this, Carl Jean June was on the ground and he was tweeting constantly about what he was seeing there. And people started following him and they would take his information and, and, and put it into the format. And so we ended up with, with um, 3,000 tweet tweets from this translating behavior. Um, oh, no, uh, 1,000, and then they, they got retweeted. We ended up with 3,000 total, but 1,000 are different tweets of, uh, of people translating information. And so our, our use scenario changed from this idea that it would be an affected person using it to this idea that a remote volunteer could use this sort of um, human computation, uh, if you guys have, have t t learned about that, but it's sort of this, this human computation activity where people in the crowd can process information. And so we actually do some research about these re um, remote volunteers, but it was very quickly that we realized that Tweak the Tweet wasn't the only thing they were doing. It was a tiny part of this rich digital volunteer activity of people that were trying to help out in the remote crowd. So when I say remote crowd, they weren't in Haiti. Um, they were actually all over the world. A lot of them were in French-speaking Canada, but they were people on almost every continent, Australia, there were people in the Middle East, um, Europe, and the US. And, and, and they were just w working to um, do a variety of different things. And so for us, Tweak the Tweet becomes a portal to this crowd work. And my next study that I did was the study of real focus on digital volunteers. So who were they, and, and, and how did they come together, and what were they trying to do? Jeff. I have a quick question for 
before we switch gears, um, as part of that research, did you get any insight into how the tweet tweets were then being used within the crisis response itself? So they were they weren't being used then. Um, over years and years of deploying this, I finally have the traction where um, I've heard back now from a couple uh, FEMA and some other groups that during some of the hurricanes. They're looking into it. Now they want the data in a different format because they're not allowed to access Google tools from their government computers and, and things like this. And they're not really allowed to tell people that they're listening to it because they have all these problems. These uh, government agencies in the US and other, uh, other places that have liability issues have a lot of problems telling the world that they're going to listen to this new um, information source because they don't know how they're going to process it. And they don't want to have another 911 uh, uh, service open up because they don't have the capacity to deal with it. And so there's all these organizational issues. So it's just starting to get traction in that sense. And the way that it was used in Haiti was really um, as a signal by these digital volunteers that they knew that they were doing what they were doing. But I'll, I'll talk about that later. But it was really, it, it, it wasn't used, well, some of the information ended up in the Ushahidi platform, which ended up on a crisis map, which the humanitarian responders were like, we don't know what to do with it. Um, so it, it, it was getting there, but only a tiny bit at that time. Um, so we ended up doing uh, an analysis, like a, we call it virtual ethnography, but we're looking at all these tweets. And um, from the 340 Twitterers, it had almost 300,000 tweets. I didn't read all of them, but I read a lot of them. Um, and I did interviews with uh, 19. We, so we identified the 74, and we managed to contact and interview 19 Tweet the Tweet translators. And they told us about what they were doing, what they were <laughs> trying to do, and how they came about, uh, how they came to do it. And so here's a quote from one of those interviews. I think that's when I went on Twitter and started tweeting. Then I discovered a whole bunch of people tweeting for Haiti. I started doing it myself and building up connections as much as I could in order to try to save some lives if possible. So for a lot of the respondents in our study, like Twitter was the portal of their activities. They actually they didn't know that they were going to volunteer. They didn't know what they were going to do. Um, they just had this tool, and they were like, well, let me, let me see how I can use it. And then they would go there and um, see other people doing it, and then they would start copying it, and they would, and they would try to do this behavior. So what was it that they were doing? In the most basic sense, from all of them, almost all of them, the first thing they do, and the thing that they do most often, is identify and, act and amplify actionable information. And here's an example I'm going to use. So Mark Wynn was on the ground in Haiti. So there's a few people that were tweeting from Haiti. Very quickly, the crowd identified them, and they start um, retweeting them. It, what's happened here is after, about two weeks after the earthquake, um, this issue of human trafficking of children became really salient in the US media and other, and other places. And so people started paying attention to that. So this guy's reporting that he, there might be some human trafficking of children going on. And within about a, well, within an hour, 15 people had retweeted this. But with, I think eventually 16 do. So very quickly, the crowd, and this is 16 of just the people we identified who were tweet, tweet tweeter. Uh, uh, it's a tongue twister but who are um, using Tweak the Tweet, right? So within that small group, we have 16 authors um, retweeting this information very quickly. And then when they told us why were they doing that, well, very simply, I wanted to pass around information I thought was relevant. And then um, this next one is actually a little more interesting. I quickly identified the sources of good information, the people who meant well but got tricked by hoaxers and tricksters, and the people actually in Haiti, both locals, journalists, <coughs> and aid workers. So the second quote is actually really important because it shows up again and again um, in, in, our, in our research. So if we're thinking about designing to take advantage of any of these behavior, we see that they're not just trying to identify good information or information they think is good. They try to find people that they think have good information, whether they're on the ground or somewhere else, and they amplify this, this information. And um, it happens over and over again. It's sort of like, it's like the gateway to digital volunteerism is this, the retweeting good information. So the next thing we, we started seeing was, uh, or the next thing we saw was that they were routing information to response organizations. And so in this case, we had um, almost 20 different instances of this, I think even more, um, where different, uh, where Twitterers would see the information, and then they would make a tweet out of it and send it by putting the account name in their tweets. They would send it to the Red Cross or to Navy News or Team Rubicon, who was an NGO that had people on the ground in Haiti. So people would find information, and, and, and first they would just amplify it, and then they started finding people to send it to, where they could, they could try to connect the information with someone who could use it. And so explaining that behavior, by searching Twitter and finding these people, we could send them details on where to go and who needed what. For instance, if we saw they were headed to a particular area, 
So they actually were like, so people in the remote crowd were trying to find out which NGOs were in which places, find information from people who had needs in those places, and send it to them using Twitter. So they started to act like remote operators in this um, situation where there, there was just um, not a lot of way to, to meet a lot of these needs, and the people on the ground themselves didn't have good communication tools at the time. Another thing they did um, was verify information. And this is sort of something that they didn't always start out doing it. Pr pretty soon they realized, gosh, I shouldn't just be sending out any old information or retweeting whatever I see. Many of them learned this the hard way um, because people called them out on it. But they eventually started verifying information. And this quote, um, which talks about verifying, actually, I hope it's big enough for you guys to see, actually gives um, a lot of more insight into, into what this, this digital volunteerism ethic that was developing. So this um, volunteer said, crisis tweeting is an art, really. So you can see at this point, this is a couple months after the event. We didn't interview him right away. We, did, we, we took a couple months figuring it out. Um, she says, this activity has been defined as something. She calls it tw crisis tweeting. It's something that she does. It has a name. Accuracy can mean the difference between life and death for the people directly affected. That's why we ask that people not retweet information they haven't confirmed. So this is not only saying that she's learned this lesson, like that, that she's not going to do it, but there's, she's actively shaping the behavior of others. So these digital volunteers start going out and trying to get other people to do the right thing, shape their behavior so they're not putting bad information in the system. They're not over amplifying bad information. Sometimes during Haiti, people would tweet info or urgent needs, and it was several days old. People want to help, but don't appreciate that they may cause harm. And so they're reflecting on these lessons and recounting a lesson learned. And you can see like a structure for their, their work um, uh, emerging uh, through these interactions with themselves and also the constraints of the technology. So we've got this problem that information gets out of, da out of date. So people were retweeting something that someone needed to be saved, but actually it was four days old. And this what might cause problems with responders going to the wrong places. So the constraints of the technology are actually wrapped up into the structure of their work and the rules that, they have, that they're developing for how they do their work and what they do. And um, I relate this in, in some of my work to structuration theory by Giddens and Orlikowski um, that talks about how this, this relationship between technology, structure and, action, structure, and action. Another interesting thing was um, how they came together. Um, this is another quote from the interviews. In the beginning, I worked alone. I started recognizing people who seemed to have good info. And we would support each other, retweet each other, and help find info for each other. And in fact, they all, uh, they, 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 they came together in a very interesting way. So this is just the 74 people that translated a tweet to tweet. And we can see four people sort of did this in a vacuum. They, 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 they saw the information, they translated, they put it out there. But the rest of them, if you look at their tweet streams, these connections aren't friend following relationships. They're actually people talking to each other through, through mentions in their tweets, so public messages to each other within the group. And, and, and as you can see, it's, it's a pretty tight group. And so and the, the line thickness is how much the conversations were going on between those two users. So um, we do this, uh, we pull together and say, oh, there's this, there's this network graph. Well, that's interesting. All the volunteers knew each other. A lot of them did. So let me, we went back and did an interview with them. And we said, how many of these people that you were talking to did you know before the Haiti earthquake? Had you talked to on Twitter, in real life, I don't care where? And, Three of them had known one other person in the network of the 19 we have. So you extrapolate, do the math. I think it's like 10 or 11. 10 or 11 of these connections were probably there prior to, prior to the Haiti earthquake. So the, what we see is this sort of emergent organization where, um, where people come together uh, during, in the aftermath of these events and form an, an organization. And actually, we um, see some evidence of that uh, in disasters prior to social media and anything else, emergent organizations have often come together where people start coordinating activity after disaster events. So this maps on to what we know about disasters as well as um, interesting things about social media. There's also this, do you have a question? I was curious if you, I mean, maybe I, you can wait for the end to answer this, but if you have any idea how people got hooked into that network. How they got hooked in? Um, my, uh, as far as I can tell, they saw other people doing it, and then, they, and, and then they would identify people that were sending the information, and then they would say, hey, I have information for you, okay, and then they would, it was all sort of through their activities. So um, when I imagine it, and I, I guess this is the side where I talk about it, 
It's like, so during, due to the public nature of tweets and the fact that you can have like non-reciprocal relationships, you can actually connect to people during events. You can send messages to people that you're not connected to. So you can send messages to whomever you want. Um, so there's, and, and all the activity is visible so you can see each other. At the same time, we see all that, that, all that identification activity, the retweets, um, the address tweets, the way people mark up the tweets. So a lot of that information, the activity to process the stuff and to, and to move it around actually becomes some of these connections. You can see how the, the tweet the tweet was a marker for people to be using, uh, to be doing the verifying activity and some other things. A lot of the interviewees said, we used tweet the tweet to, to mark it to show people we were digital volunteers or to show them we were doing the right thing. Um, but then they could see how other people were doing that and they could, they could start connecting to them. So their digital volunteer activity actually becomes part of how this structure emerges and what it looks like, which we think is um, kind of fascinating. Um, I might have time to talk about it at the end. We'll see. Uh, and so um, at the end of this study, uh, uh, it was studying the volunteers. A group of these volunteers, uh, a small group of them, at, actually it was maybe 10 or 15, moved off and formed their own organization. They actually became an NGO, uh, formal 5013 nonprofit in March of 2010, so just a couple months after the earthquake, with the intention to, to keep responding to Haiti and then to respond to other events as digital volunteers. And they named themselves Humanity Road. And Humanity Road has become the focus of some of my uh, more recent work. I went off and did, went off to my computer. And I was a participant of, uh, observer of Humanity Road for 17 months, um, where I would uh, be with them trying to help them respond to different events. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, Humanity Road and how they work and what they did. But they basically were a, a group of volunteers that branched off. They brought in some new people. They lost people over time. And now they are a virtual response organization that goes from event to event to event, um, trying to help process information in different ways. And, and they also they have this expanding organization, which also fits the model of um, what we've seen in disaster response before. So we've seen organizations. Uh, that are expanding. I think I would map Humanity Road to something like a digital Red Cross, if that makes sense. It's, it's sort of a, a Red Cross-like organization. They expand during events, take on more people, and then after events, they sort of contract. Virtual organization, as I said, they actually have a global workforce. So they have people from, from all over the globe working, um, which is interesting because they, um, they can cover events that happen all the time because they have people in all sorts of time zones. And they can pass off work from one to another as they go. Um, volunteers are members of the organization. Uh, this is a little different than that sort of immersion organization. These people uh, for Humanity Road, they go through trainings, they sign up, they get on a web page, they're formally members of the organization. Um, although they do take in spontaneous volunteers during events and try to train them very quickly and incorporate into them, their organization. They have about, they have like eight to ten core members of people that go from event to event to event. Then they've got maybe 15 peripheral members who join every once in a while and then during events, they can usually get new people from the affected area, but they usually only stay a couple of days. Their mission statement gives you a good picture of kind of what they do and what they think they are, who they think they are. Humanities Road mission is to educate the public before, during, and after disasters on how to survive, sustain, and reunite with loved ones. Um, you can see how some of this echoes some of the earlier activities of the digital volunteers. Their volunteers are trained and equipped to use internet and mobile communications technologies to collect, verify, and route information online during sudden onset disaster. So they did a very good job of identifying what it was that they were doing as volunteers and trying to sort of codify that and make that into uh, uh, an organizational practice. Using the internet, they provide public safety information as well as directing the public to governmental and aid agencies that are providing assistance for the disaster. So they're trying to connect themselves to emergency response, and that's actually something they've been working on. They work through um, a lot of different platforms that are on. They use a lot of different tools. They will try anything. Um, they are a researcher's dream because they will incorporate your technology until they realize that it's holding them back. Um, and they do have a lot of researchers working with them, not just me, because um, they're doing interesting work and they're an interesting design case. They mostly work through Skype, which is like their virtual offices. So they go to work by just you know logging on to Skype, seeing what people are doing. Skype is actually where they coordinate, where they train, teach, where they organize, socialize. Like almost everything happens there. It actually gets quite confusing. They, they, um, I have some shown some incidents where they've been trying to um, 
better organized using different tools because Skype kind of becomes a mess. They use Twitter for a lot of different reasons. They monitor information. It's used for outgoing messages um, to tell people what to do. They talk to people that are affected using Twitter. Uh, they use it for recruiting. And they also use Google Documents for coordinating scheduling, things like that. You can see where this sort of echoes their, their um, mission statement. What they are is just they're a virtual organization. One of the things they, does that they do that are it's interesting is they send out tweetables, which are like these little um, packaged tweets that they have a list, a spreadsheet somewhere. So if you're in Humanity Road and you want to do some outgoing messages, messaging during an event, you pick up a tweetable and you send it out. And in this way, they can actually control what their volunteers are messaging so they don't message the wrong things. So basically, they, they try to tell people when an event's going on, okay, the water's rising, get out of, you know, these very um, basic... Uh, disaster response stuff, and it's very similar to what the Red Cross puts out in some of their, um, well, the Red Cross is tweeting this stuff too now, actually. Um, their most used tweetable is not surprising to me, but this one shows up all the time if you do an analysis on their tweets. Verify twice, tweet once, rumors put lives at risk. Um, you can see this, I, I position them as sort of being, they see themselves as social media edu educators, like they're out there to now tell people how to tweet correctly during response, uh, during disaster events. Um, which is interesting in its own respect because people can be re can resist that messaging as well. And um, one of the most interesting things they do is they create these resources where during events happen when events are happening, they take information from all over the place. They take all the damage reports, all the reports of where the airports are, where the shelters are, who are the people responding to this event, and they put it on a in a common resource that anyone can access. Um, and so they. They're basically synthesizing information in a way that, um, that that kind of other activity didn't do, where the information's kind of out there, nobody can really figure out how to use it. They're trying to become a resource for, for um, people that are affected and government aid. And they're doing a better job over time of establishing these. But event after event after event, they put these out. And for many of them, nobody really looks at them. Um, but they're starting to figure out ways to, get, to, to match this activity to the needs of responders. They have some interesting questions that are, are fascinating for me as I've been researching them. They're constantly trying to figure out what kind of work they can do and what kind of work they should do. So they've got all these in issues of capacity. So the, the Red Cross, you've got a large Red Cross and you've got these local places and something happens and the local chapter expands and responds. And then something happens somewhere else and that local chapter expands and responds. Humanity Road could literally go to um, seven events a day, depending on where they draw the line of what events they have. So they, they, they say they want to be a global virtual response group. So they could be working all the time. But they have a limited amount of, of capacity. They have a limited amount to respond to different events. And so they're constantly negotiating whether this event is big enough, whether we have the right uh, capacity, whether, like for the Libya violence that was happening before the revolution or before the um, change there. I don't exactly know how to characterize some of those things. They were thinking, well, should we respond? Should we try to help in some way there? Or could we do, could we do damage and things like that? So they, um, they're constantly negotiating this, and it's fascinating to watch. Um, here's an example. The, Bang the Bangkok flooding is still bad, but with language barriers, we haven't had much success in that area of the world. So here we have this virtual response team. All of a sudden, they want to be more official and move from event. They want to tap into to formal response. And yet they're having to work out a lot of organizational issues of where they belong, what their role is. And we've been trying, kind of trying to figure out what is their role for a group like this. And they're, they're not the only ones. There's other groups trying to do this. One straight question. One of the obvious uses of information technology in these situations is family reunification. Yes. And is that something they want to get into or they want to let somebody else do that? They actually, they absolutely do. It's one of the first things they were doing before they actually, the two, that's, two people that were catalysts for starting the group had done family reunification using technology before social media. After, well, social media was there, but they were using bulletin board technologies, and they were helping connect people after the Hurricane Katrina. They had somehow worked with Red Cross to get a van to drive around with a bunch of equipment so people could get online and figure out um, family reunification. So they've always seen that as part of their goal. And they, they try to figure out where people are missing. Only thing is, we've we've got the Google Person Finder. We've got a lot. There's a lot of other technologies out there too that are doing things like that. And so um, it's interesting to see where the needs are because th that might not be the biggest need anymore because we've got other technologies filling that gap. We actually have been seeing them sort of as the steward of the stewards of the commons. I don't know if we've um, 
if anyone's heard of o Ostrom's work on governing the commons, but there's this idea that you know the commons can't be governed, it'll always just sort of destroy itself, and then Ostrom came back and said, there's ways to govern the commons, but you have to do it from within the commons. You can't be like some group and say, okay, you've got this space, you've all been functioning, and we're gonna put our, our rules in there, and, and, and that, that, that's usually unsuccessful. But Humanity Road is a sort of example of people that have risen up in this space, and they're trying to, to enact order within this space to sort of make it, make it usable. And, um, and they have this big question again of how to connect their efforts with formal response, and they're working um, they're now working with the U.S. Navy. They're working with UNOCHA in different places to try to, um, they're doing exercises together to try to match their capacities. They have all this capacity, um, and they could actually have more capacity if people knew that they were connected to, if their efforts were actually going to help. And they have these questions of how to match these crowd capacities to um, formal response. So way switching the equation now. So I'm gonna move away from this very like, studying a few people doing very specific kinds of work to step back and, and look at things from sort of the 10,000 foot level. And so um, these are not in order, but in the middle of my Humanity Road study, I also did this study on, um, on the Egypt Revolution and we rewrote a paper how, how the revolution will be re retweeted and um, I'm sure many of you remember these events, but um, it's very interesting. In 2010, Malcolm Gladwell pens that um, New Yorker essay, and he says, the revolution will not be tweeted. And then um, we talked about this during lunch, but I would, uh, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, social media, <laughs> sorry. We, we, can't, we can't say exactly how, how much, but social media was definitely used. And I'll show you some, some statistics to show you that people on the ground were using it, but social media, including Twitter and Facebook, were used during the Arab Spring revolutions in 2011 in Tunisia, Egypt, and then off in other countries as well. And for these mass disruption events, we begin to see the ma similar mass convergence. There's very similar mass convergence from crises. We were w witnessing global participation, and we theorized that, that some, some global crowd work was also going on, and we wanted to know what, what kinds of crowd work, well, we, we theorized that crowd was working in some ways, and we went and looked to see if they were, and um, we found some things we didn't expect, but we found some things we did. So what we did, um, our methods on this, for, for these big sets of social media data, if you want to do sort of the qualitative, quantitative analysis we're doing, but we do, we do get into the data, uh, sampling and figuring out how you're going to cut the data and what you're going to look at is often one of the most interesting questions. But um, for this data, we had over 2 million tweets, uh, over 300,000 Twitterers, and we decided to focus on information uh, diffusion as a measure of crowd work, so people spreading retweets and, and, and spreading information in different ways. And that was informed by our previous work on, um, on the fact that people identify and amplify in, in, information when they're acting in, as digital volunteers. And so what we did was we identified the most retweeted Twitterers. So not, we're not looking at the crowd, we're looking at who the crowd recommends the most. And we went and determined a location for a sample of these, and we did it um, qualitatively, where we went through all their tweets and um, with an Arab speaker and, and English speakers and um, figured out whether people were on the ground in Cairo during the events or not. And this is kind of fascinating, but in, so we took a thousand most retweeted Twitter, so the people the crowd recommended the most, took a sample of that, and we ended up finding 30% uh, of the most highly retweeted Twitterers were in Cairo at the time of the event. And um, I am certain to say that 30% of all the people twittering, tweeting during that event um, were not in Cairo. Uh, that I'm sure of. So um, you can see that the crowd very, at a very basic level is acting as a filtration center or identification um, network to find people on the ground but it gets a little more interesting than that. So again, we knew some of this was happening from, from our uh, studies that showed that the crowd was amplifying and identifying uh, information coming from the ground. Um, we knew that we can see that the retweet acts as a recommendation mechanism, but it actually isn't quite as straightforward as that. So we've got this, these two things. So um, people have a tendency to retweet information that has a broad appeal, like pictures, things that are funny, jokes. The photograph of the people getting married in Tahrir Square was very popular. So there's these kinds, kinds of information that has broad appeal. And then there's a kind, kinds of information that have local utility, like we're all going over to this bridge because the other way has been blocked. And we see some tweets like that too. And so the crowd tweet treats, jeez, the crowd treats that information in different ways. God, these are a lot of tongue, tongue twisters today. The crowd treats that information in different ways. 
And, um, and one of the interesting things is that Quack et al. identified that there's a gap between the number of followers and the number of times a cat account is retweeted. So if you just simply take who's retweeted the most, you get 30%. You get some idea, and you can get closer, but, um, but it's, not, it's not the whole equation. So I theorized, and I, I did this using some tools I had. It was pretty simple, very quickly. It took me three seconds. Um, that uh, the times retweeted uh, over the initial number of followers is a pretty good filter. Um, it gets much better than 30%. And I'll explain that a little bit here. Um, so we found three things. Um, Three things that were interesting. There's actually a few more and we didn't test, but okay, so if a person is retweeted a lot, they're more likely to be on the ground. But if a person has a whole bunch of followers and they're retweeted a lot, it really doesn't tell us much about anything. But if a person has, a, has very few followers during an event and all of a sudden this event happens and they're retweeted a lot, they're a lot more likely to be on the ground. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Well, the next part was interesting too, and this comes from our empirical study. So if you're retweeted once, a whole bunch, so excuse me, if you retweeted for one tweet, a whole bunch, so I wrote something that was so funny and a thousand people retweeted me during this event, I'm, it doesn't make, mean I'm more likely on the ground, but if you retweeted for a lot of different things, a lot of different kinds of things um, over the time of the event, then you must be an interesting source. So maybe not a, you're not a retweeted a lot, maybe only 15 people are retweeting you, but you retweeted for a whole bunch of different things you're more likely to be on the ground. So we started seeing, like, translating some of our empirical work to some of these measures that aren't necessarily in a, in a tweet profile. Like, you actually have to go calculate some of these things. And um, we're able to come up with a, a pretty good way to filter pe for people on the ground. And we did some machine learning studies uh, on that um, with the Occupy protests, which didn't do as well as we hoped, but um, showed some promise as well. And so stepping back a little bit, um, so the different kinds of studies, I'm going to kind of try to talk about crowd work um, that we've seen in a, in a broader sense and talk about my efforts to sort of characterize this. And um, again, uh, some, some resistance to the crowdsourcing term. And uh, I have to admit, I, I kept going, I went to crowdsourcing workshops and things, and I had all this research I'm doing, and I'm seeing the crowd do all this interesting stuff. And, then, and I was at the workshop, and I'm like, these people aren't talking about what I'm talking about. So I, um, I try to figure out, so where do I fit within crowdsourcing, or where does this kind of um, work fit within crowdsourcing, and, and what is this, how can we expand our ideas of, of what the crowd is capable of? So I want to start out a little bit and unpack crowdsourcing. Um, and, and this is, this is a little bit of just, is that a, it's just something I've been interested in doing for a while, and I think I finally found one of the problems that I was having. But so Jeff Howe coins crowdsourcing in 2006, and he's a journalist. We, don't know, we, don't, we decided earlier we don't know why that term caught on better than other terms, except it was snazzier. He writes a book in 2003. On his website, he then posts two different definitions for crowdsourcing. And in one of them, he uh, calls crowdsourcing, uh, well, he uses different terms. In one, he's talking about crowdsourcing is the act of taking a job traditionally performed by a designated agent and outsourcing it to an undefined, generally large group of people. So in that, that definition is outsourcing. In his soundbite version, he's saying the application of open source principles to fields outside of software. So it's open source. So OK, source is in both of those, but the source is very different. <laughs> Source and open source has to do with open code. The source stands for code. Source and outsource is a workforce that you push out. So there's, there's very different ideas. And so I actually put crowdsourcing sort of on a scale between open source and outsourcing. Except when I run into people that are just talking about it, um, not, not nine times out of 10, but a lot. I, I have a class I'm teaching on crowds and crowdsourcing. And I had everyone say what their definition was. And the first day, almost all of the definitions look a lot like outsourcing. You think Mechanical Turk, you think of these ideas where you have this idea, you design a system, you break things up into little parts, everybody does their little parts, they put it back together, and, and that's what you get. And um, that's certainly not a lot of what I saw, though some of the work that we did d does fall in that area. So I imagine crowdsourcing is sort of this, this spectrum between outs open source and, and outsourcing. And then some of the work I, I've been seeing actually falls off that scale, too. I think this emergent collective behavior, which I'm calling crowd work, doesn't necessarily fit in some of our ideas of, of crowdsourcing. So what I, what I was doing was research that kind of hit all over the scale. Um, we can see that the, the tweet the tweet translation work kind of was emergent collective behavior and maybe moving over towards some open source where people said, hey, let's do this and let's do it this way. 
Although there were some people that were just taking our instructions that they could do it in that way and translating it. So there was some sort of um, micro work activity within Tweak the Tweet translation. You can look at some of the um, Egypt Twitters. I didn't talk closely about this, but there was this case of people who were, um, during the Egypt event, they were propagating a meme. I don't know if you, anybody see the progress bar meme? Did anybody see the progress bar meme? They kept like doing the progress bar meme, but then switching what it meant. So they were like, um, de uninstalling Mubarak, 99% complete. And then someone would say, installing freedom, 99.9% .9 complete. And so they were all like sort of playing off of this. And it was sort of this emergent collective behavior to show solidarity. And then some of the um, identifying people on the ground and, and retweeting, we can kind of see as collective behavior. The, the Volan tweeters were definitely this emergent collective behavior that then moved over maybe into an open source like community. And then I see Humanity Road and some other, some other groups I've been looking at kind of move off. Um, they're, they're open source communities. They come together. They decide they want to do this activity. They kind of figure out their ways. And then they start acting like an outsourcing outfit where we do this and someone can ask us to do this. And then we'll complete the test. But we're going to decide how we do it. But we'll complete tasks for you. So this sort of difference between we all kind of define how we do it to we, you give us a task and, and, and we'll do it for you to someone else tells us what to do and how to do it. And, and it's, so this kind of scale. Michael. Do you think that the emerging community collective behavior situation is a stable one? Is that how long can groups sustain an undefined goal? I, uh, I, I see this constant movement. Of, from the emergent collective, and it's not even, it's a constant movement this way, um, from other groups as well, including Ushahidi, is you see this kind of tendency to, yeah, you emerge, you can't be emergent all the time. I think it'll emerge again. Like after, you know, after the Joplin tornado, digital volunteer groups emerged. They were totally new. They had a few people that might have done other events before, so they totally moved. But, um, but for the groups that want to put down structure, I think as you put down structure, you become more of these other, other types of things, and there's sort of this shift I've seen this shift to the right. I'm bad with my right and left. That's really bad for a former athlete to admit it. Um, but interestingly enough, I want to talk a little bit about Ushahidi before I kind of um, clean up the talk a little bit and, and, and pull it out. Um, because Ushahidi is the major um, uh, digital volunteer, not the major, but it's one place where a lot of digital volunteerism has been happening in the form of crisis mapping. So after the Haiti earthquake, Ushahidi, which was a platform that was developed in Kenya um, around uh, reporting ethnic violence, they um, launched it in, the cr in, a, in a crisis sense in combination with a, an SMS shortcode so people could send text messages um, for free from Haiti with their needs to a platform. Then they had a group of people to translate that from the, the Creole language to English. And then they had a group of people um, categorizing that information, trying to map it. And they had these very interesting, um, they, they developed a very interesting work practice where they divide it up in groups. This group verifies, this group maps, this group categorizes. And so we had this, This uh, they brought in, initially it was co-located people at Tufts University, but then they started using a larger crowd to do it. It was basically this crowdsourced effort to help process information coming from, a ground, from the ground during the Haiti earthquake. and. Um, in the same sense, that was like an open source effort. They're like, we have this platform. You can come help me process it. But over time, there's been a group of people who are um, crisis mappers who have who've formed their organization. They go from event to event to event. You can ask them to map. You can say, oh, we need your help mapping an event. They'll take the Ushahidi platform, and they'll be on Skype. Skype calls organizing with each other, and they will map your event for you. And again, there's this sort of shift into becoming a, a having set practices that they do, they organize, and other people give them tasks. This isn't a, a perfect, um, I, mean, I think we can come up with exceptions. I, I try to put a framework down for crowdsourcing. It took me three days, I got nowhere. That was as close as I could get um, for something that maps my needs. There's just so many different things. I've also been thinking of crowd work as collective intelligence. Um, how late can I go, or should I should I wrap it up within? Because I've got like we have the room till two o five. Room till two o five, and I want to give at least ten minutes questions. I'll try to wrap it up in three or four minutes. So I've been thinking of crowd work as collective intelligence. Um, I've actually been using a digital uh, distributed cognition view um, and seeing. Uh, I don't want to take you through all of this. Um, I've been seeing uh, distributed cognition holds that um, cognition is socially distributed across physical and digital resources. 
And I've been using this to see how cognition is, is distributed across the digital volunteers in these networks that I'm seeing. And talking to Edwin Hutchins, he says when he, when he, when he thinks that he was a, came up with this idea of distributed cognition, he says when you think about it as this question, what information goes where, when, and in what form? Well, as I was looking at all this Twitter activity, I was seeing, okay, representations. It's, it's transformations of representations. Let me unwind it. So I was seeing all these tweets, this representation of information, and then I was seeing these transformations that were happening in different ways. So different ones of these, different members of the network, different nodes, were filtering information, recommending it, routing it, verifying it, and they were creating new, and they were creating new representations from that um, that had different kinds of information in different formats. So they were, you know, you could amplify if you, that, that shows you where it goes, and, and routing it points it to other places, and then you could format it so it changes the structure. And then you can see this idea of, of these, these networks. So if you imagine this is a digital volunteer network, and it's embedded in a much bigger network. And you've got these nodes that are, that are trying to get information out. Maybe some people are amplifying it. And then all of a sudden, it gets into this network. And then the network lights up because it's good information. And like seven people retweet it. And then someone in there sends it off to the Red Cross. And you can see this sort of like cognitive architecture where the information is moving around. So when, you think, when I think about collective intelligence, like I instantly see these, these tweets moving around and these, these networks acting as sensors for good information or sensors for, for bad information where they kind of attack it and the different ways that, that it happens. And so I wanna, I'm going to give you a little story. I think I'm going to end it on that. Um, so somewhere last spring, I was talking to Humanity Road. And they wanted, to talk, they wanted me to, they knew I was a researcher. They were like, oh, I have a problem for you. I really want to know what happened in this one instance in Haiti. And I know you have the data. And there was this hospital up in Malo, Haiti. This, this question, let me backtrack a little bit. This question also speaks to people always ask me about impact of this work. It's very hard to quantify. It's very hard to quantify how the digital volunteers helped during Haiti. Um, but there was this hospital up in the northern part of Haiti. So the, um, the earthquake was down in the south. And um, the roads were all, had, had been severely damaged. It was very hard to get from the south to the north. There were thousands and thousands of people waiting outside of medical field hospitals for amputations and treatment and all sorts of things. And, and they just, they couldn't get them fast enough and they were just waiting for treatment. And there was a hospital in Malo, Haiti, up in the north that had capacity for initially 70, but eventually 200. After three days, they expanded to 200. They had capacity and they had no patients. And they sent out, they didn't use Twitter directly, but they were on Facebook. They were on CNN iReport. They sent out hundreds and hundreds of emails. And I see these because the information then showed up on, um, in comments of other people would write, like Anderson Cooper puts out some blog about, about Haiti. These people would put it in comments, this information. We've got a hospital in Malo. It is empty. We have 70 beds. All you have to do, we have a helicopter pad. We've got all this information. So they put it on social media. Twitter picks it up. All these digital volunteers are putting it out there. They're like, here it is. And, they're, and they're, I, f I find all this information from tweets that point to it. So I use Twitter to sort of point to the, as a record of what the digital space looks like. Um, but all this information, like we've got this, this hospital and it's open. And, and so I talked to Humanity Road and they said, yeah, we saw this. And then we sent this tweet to the US Coast Guard. And the next day, the Coast Guard was delivering patients there. And we saw it on, on, um, on uh, CNN. And this was like, it, they sent out the message for five or six days that they had a hospital. And it was only later in the, in the week. So it took almost five days to get patients into the hospital. Eventually, it gets crowded. So she, wants, she says, I want to know if it was my tweet to the US Coast Guard that, that got patients delivered there. And it was the US Coast Guard bringing them in. And I said, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. But I said, uh, I was like, well, you know, I don't think it matters because you know your tweet was out there and there were all these other tweets and people were moving around. It was like collective intelligence and the, the thing was moving and it finally the information finally got routed to the right person. And she didn't want to hear that. That's not what she wanted to hear. <laughs> but I went and I said, let me, let me really go. Let me go see. And I didn't even know that, that Twitter had an impact. And I, I still can't say 100% that it did. But there were a couple um, contact information in the information. So the people were saying, we have this facility. Please contact Carol Phipp or Tim Tim Trainer, here's their phone numbers. Their different contact information show up in different tweets. 
So I, I tried to contact Carol Phipp and, and Tim Trainer, and I finally got on the phone with Tim Trainer, who was in Haiti at the time. He was working with the hospital, and he said, here's what happened. We had this facility. The Red Cross knew they were there. All the NGOs knew they were there. They came. They said, you're too small. We can't use you. We can't get the people up here. Sorry. And so, and so they weren't being used. And so people knew we were on the map. Like the big people knew we were on the map. The smaller people didn't. And the US government didn't know what was going on. And they were just trying to help. And so we used social media. We, we purposefully put the information out everywhere we could. And we don't know how it happened, but eventually the US Coast Guard emailed Carol Phipp, who was in all these things. We connected. And eventually they was, the place filled up. They did um, over 300 amputations. They treated over 800 patients. Um, they had a huge survival rate. I'm not going to give you numbers because it breaks my heart when the other numbers are there. But they um, are able to treat people. And they do credit social media as making those connections. And I think if you take. So if you take, uh, like she, she made, you know, this woman who makes this tweet, and I don't know if her tweets, tweet makes it, but if you take out all of this activity of all of these people, not just people on Twitter, because there were other people taking the information and posting it onto iReports and other things, and other places, all that digital volunteer in, uh, activity helped to make the connection, because the US Coast Guard was not connected with Carol Phipp prior to the, prior to the event. And, and that's sort of the role of this social media. But I see it as this, this collective intelligence of helping information sort of filter and move till it gets to where it needs to get. Um, ongoing and future work, I plan to continue to do um, empirical studies of the emerging ecosystem of digital volunteerism. There's a lot of different groups. It's interesting watching their structure emerge and how they're going to figure out how to work together. Um, I'm also interested in designing tools to help support and leverage crowd work. I have this. Uh, Continuing the studies I was doing with the Egypt study is trying to develop machine learning techniques that, that learn from crowd behavior to help um, do things and maybe even learn from more complex crowd work behavior. I'm also interested, in, uh, this question shows up again and again, is connecting these, these crowd capacities that we've identified to the emergency and humanitarian response. Like they have, form, they have formal policies in place and how, to, how do we figure out what their needs are and meet their needs. Um, I described it earlier as all of a sudden they have this whole new feed of information. But they don't know how to weight that information. They're very used to collecting information in a certain way and knowing, OK, if I have this information, I respond there. But when it comes through social media, there could be all these other elements that they don't know, including access, including misinformation, and all those other things. So they're trying to figure out how they weight that information. And finally, um, I'm interested in identifying other features and capacities of mass participation and looking at applying these to other problems. And that's it. Oh, yes, acknowledgments. I want to. Uh, I always thank my um, colleagues at uh, University of Colorado, especially Professor Leisha Palin, a lot of this work she's a co-author on, and the U.S. Uh, S uh, National Science Foundation. Thank you. Pardon me? There's a few minutes for Yeah, there is. <laughs> Um, I know a lot of altruism goes into uh, digital volunteerism. Do you know or uh, are aware of any initiatives to return, kind of like that Coast Guard example that you just mentioned, back to the contributors the information about their impact or the results of what they've done? Um, I know of none. I know it's a huge problem uh, for for the organizations that are trying to set themselves up and make connections, without the information of how they have impact, it's very hard to convince both people they want to serve as affected people and the organizations they want to work with. It's, it's hard to figure out how, when, when they don't know what their effect is. And it's been very hard to measure their effect because a lot of it's just, it's happening here. We're not on the ground. And in fact, I've been talking to more traditional researchers of traditional emergency response. They always have that problem. It's hard to measure. Um, impact during a, in a disaster situation when your primary concern is not documenting it, your primary concern is helping. And so um, I think that's, that's a big question is defining ways to measure it. And even when you get to measurement, you start to get to some, some awkward things. But um, we've been really good at identifying the capacity in the work and very hard. If, if, uh, it's been very hard to, to measure the impact. Um, and it's a problem for all digital volunteer communities, as far as I can tell. Michael. So how do these volunteers deal with cynicism that comes out on the internet around these the phenomena of slacktivism and these kinds of things where people say, well, you're just retweeting. You're not actually helping. Do they have a knee-jerk reaction to that? Do they actually think about it? 
So I, the interviews that I've done have been with people that are very intense digital volunteers, people that were spending um, during the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake. Um, you can see it from their tweet streams. They're spending 16 hours a day online um, doing this activity. And, and they don't think of themselves as just doing, as just retweeting. They, they actually, um, they think of themselves as, as really impacting things. A lot of them have stories about how they impacted things that you can kind of unwind and say, I mean, I finally unwound the Haiti, the Humanity Road uh, connection to the Malo Hospital, and in fact, their tweet came after the U.S. Coast Guard arrived. So, um, in, in in fact, it did, did not have any effect. I have not yet told them that, but um, but so they have they have these ideas of of how they've impacted things, and um, it's 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 hard. It's hard to it's hard to unwind um, what it, what's going to mean for most of them. They they don't. They let. They slough it off. They're like, oh yeah, but I think I, we did this, and, and I'm and I'm helping. And I have. There are incidences. I mean, I've been doing this uh, peripherally every once, to, you know, uh, every once in a while, over and over again, over two years. I've been, you know, peripherally involved in this, whether it's through Humanity Road or, or running a tweet the tweet thing. And during the Colorado fires, we're online. We're trying to help. People are all yelling at each other. It gets really political. It gets really ugly. I've never seen anything like it. We should probably do a study on that too. But people start, and they're all they're evacuated from their houses. They're yelling at the government. They're yelling at each other. And this poor guy was, he was getting, people were flaming him. And he was like, I don't know why you're doing this. Just, you know, why don't everybody go somewhere else? I'm out of my house. I think it's getting burned down today and something else. And I went over and I said, hey, you know what? I've never seen anything like this. I've been a researcher. It's just crazy. I'm really sorry for what you're going through. And we ended up having three or four, convers three or four tweets back and forth. And I am not a social worker. I am a computer scientist. Like, <laughs> and here I am, like, like, counseling him. And he's like, gosh, you've made me feel great. I'm just going to go offline. And I, he ended up losing his house. But he's like, this is the best I felt all day. I'm just going to go offline. And I'm just going to, you know, whatever. And you realize that, uh, that that's one, one story. I know these digital volunteers have hundreds of stories like that, because they've been doing it over and over again. So there is this impact, whether it's emotional support, whether it's you know, I, I, somebody thanked me for helping them find water after the Christchurch earthquake because I knew where it was because I was watching everything. I was like, oh, it's here. They asked. And I was like, oh, just go to this and you can find it. And so there's these little, there's all these little, little things that you can measure as a volunteer because you're there and you're talking to someone so they feel good about it. But then when the, the people that do response on the big scale is like, well, you don't have any impact. Well, it depends on how you measure or what you think about as impact because I think they, they know and they can feel and they can sense that they have, they have had impact, whether it's small or not, they don't seem to care. It seems to me like the, the impact a lot of these people have can be compared to like, the impact of a single person voting in an election. It's just like... Yeah. yeah it's, it, that's interesting. You can think about it as the, I don't know, from game theory perspectives. But yeah, you, you, you can choose not to. But if you choose to and you think other people are doing it too, then you know that you have a, a big impact on a large scale. You don't have to know exactly what your impact is. Start touching on this at the end a little bit, but I'm really interested in, in instances where uh, where the communications jump systems. So you went from say a tweet to an actual phone call, or yeah. somebody called 911 from that. Do you have any sense of how, where, when, why that happens? It's it's so hard to unwind. So I've been able. So I contacted Tim Trainer. I've been able to get Carol Fipp to answer some emails, but she's never really. Um, she seems emotionally unable to go back to revisit it, and I don't want to. She canceled the phone call we had. Um, but it's hard after the fact to identify, especially this one was two years ago now, so it's really hard to go under one. It's hard for a researcher to jump. I mean, I can see, okay, this information in almost the same format was on this comment. So I can see that this tweet was probably made from the information of that comment, or they have a common source. So you can sort of trace these common sources, but when it shifts to a phone call or a private message, I lose the trail. So as a researcher, it's hard to do it unless you find the person, the people that made those connections. So that's actually, it's almost a, a research question. It's hard to follow those connections after a certain point. But it's fascinating to watch them jump across platforms. It's a great question. I'm just curious. Um, China has sort of its own social media and its own you know, traditions of collective action. Yeah. Do you have any sense of whether this is parallel in their experience? Yeah, so there's a couple good studies of um, the use of Sino Weibo is uh, their microblogging service in China. There's a couple good papers um, from Q et al. about Sino Weibo and then also um, some, some forums in China. And they're, they're seeing the same sort of um, digital volunteer. He didn't call it that, but 
um, communities come together and try to help in different ways, including matching needs with offers of help, which is a common thing, sharing information, passing it around. So they have seen some of those. They're very um, empirical studies, and they, they, they've showed some, some impact. Very fascinating. China just put out, this is an interesting one for my research, China just put out um, new rules for volunteerism where they want to measure it. And they want people to have points according to which groups they volunteer for how long. And it's like, they're totally in changing the incentive structure. And that's not digital volunteerism. That's volunteerism in general. And with no idea that, they're, that, that when you start putting those kinds of points to the kind of activity I've been seeing, the people will walk away. They're doing this for, to feel good about themselves. To have a public measure of what they were doing, I think would actually cause them to not want to be a part of it is it's a very different incentive for why they do the work. It has to do with, um, it has to do with showing people in their social network that they're doing it. I, they like the fact that it's public. Um, that's why a lot of the, the tweet volunteerism is interesting, because you get social capital um, of, of multiple kinds from, from doing that activity, because it's visible. Um, but at the same time, they, don't, they wouldn't want to be doing it for money. They wouldn't want that kind of, if they're doing it for money or some kind of points, then that would, that would diminish their, I don't know, the motivations on this are, are fascinating. And I think they're different in, in this domain than others, but there's definitely overlap. Seems like when you start incentivizing like that too, it can also become another tool of manipulation. Another tool for? Manipulation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, it, when you get to incentives, it's just, when you think about the crowdsourcing and incentives, and each little each little adjustment really does change why, why people, and even just how, how the activity Works. Who can see it, and, and it changes changes why people participate. Even across the different um, groups, Humanity Road and, and the digital uh, the volunteers, there are different incentives for, for participating. Um, one has to do with making new connections to people, and one has to do with um, uh, sitting in those Skype chats and and having long relationships with the people that you're working for or working with. Excuse me. Anyways, okay. that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.